Welcome everybody back to another hour of the Census Fidelium Hour. This is your host, Steve Cunningham of SensesFidelium.com and Census Fidelium YouTube channel. Anyway, this week uh, we had Father Lawrence Carney in town, was it last week, to do missions all over the place on the Holy Face. He was all over this diocese, then he ended up in Raleigh for the last couple of days. Thankfully, we have some video, audio and video of that, so let's get right to him speaking because it's way more, more important than what I ever have to say. So here's Father Lawrence Carney. Yeah, we'll start with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady of the Holy Name of God, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. So I promised someone that I would only go about 40 to 45 minutes tonight. So I've got my watch here. I like to stay on time because I get short of breath pretty easily because I have a, an illness. So I want to talk to you about the devotion to the holy face of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how many of you have read three books about this devotion? Raise your hands. Okay. How many of you have never heard of this devotion until this week? Okay, so there's, there's a wide range of people here. So... As I mentioned in the sermon today, how many times is the face of God mentioned in the Bible? It's 840 times. And the countenance of God, 101 times. So, St. Therese of Lisieux, when she became devoted to this devotion, she mentioned how it seemed like every psalm, there would be the face of God would jump out at her. And that's what devotions are known for doing. They make us tender towards certain aspects of God or his church. And so this devotion might not be for all of you here, but any of you that are getting providential things that are happening, then... That means that God is he's drawing you to this. And maybe this isn't for you. Maybe it's for you to be into a different devotion. But this devotion is not new. But yet it is new. It's not new in that devotion to God is, is old. It's not new in that the people of God before Christ came they followed the Ten Commandments thoroughly and they knew what it took to follow them. But this devotion is new in a way because it's stressing how we as a human family and as a Catholic Church are not following the Ten Commandments, especially Commandments 1, 2, and 3. Because those deal with God and the last seven deal with our neighbor. So if we can't get the first three right, how can we get the last seven? How are we ever going to win abortion? Like my state of Kansas, after the Supreme Court the decision went down, they voted for abortion. They're a purple state. They've been red ever since the country started. So God is not pleased with us corporately as a human race and as a Catholic church because we're missing the first three commandments to give God his rights. So there's idolatry going on in the highest places in the Catholic Church. There's irreverence, there's blasphemy, and not worshiping him on Sundays. So we're missing those big time. And between God and human beings, which one's greater? Well, God is because he's infinite and human beings are created. He's the creator. So this devotion shows us how important that is. So... Our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to Sister May St. Pierre in the 1840s and told her 
numbers and numbers of locutions and, and just themes that are important for our times. And one of them is, they crucified me. The Jews crucified me on Friday, but Christians crucified me on Sunday. What that means is, Catholics stop going and adoring God. The first command, I mean, one of the top commandments to adore God once a week. So, a little bit of history. Sister Mary St. Pierre grew up in Rennes, France, and she wanted to be a Carmelite. And her spiritual director was a tough, a tough dog, a very tough priest. But he was known for being a spiritual director for ladies who wanted to become uh, nuns. And once they joined a convent, they would never leave from the day they started. Like he had a 100% track record. So sister wanted to join the Carmel near her house, but there was no room. So she went to the chapel of St. Martin close by her house, and it was November the 11th, the feast day of St. Martin, and his relics were being exposed. And so she came up to those relics and fervently kissed them and made piety and veneration of them. And then she said, I, St. Martin, I dearly, I dearly want to be a Carmelite. Please open a, a door for me to join, even if it's in your holy see. Well, a few years later, she told this to her spiritual director, and her spiritual director let her go there, and there was, a, there was an opening there, and she joined the Carmel. She left the world on November 11th. So you see those connections going on there, how important. God, if you are a sincere heart praying from your heart, he's going to lead you to this if this is for you. And my, my birthday is November 11th, so that's why I'm a big uh, um, promoter of this devotion. So she enters the Carmel, and as a little novice, she begins to receive these revelations. The, the main one that I always speak about in any time I give a talk is Jesus appeared to her and said, my father is greatly disappointed with the human race. And my father's going to punish the human race, not with the elements, but with revolutionary men. So this was right around, you know, 1840s, right around when the Communist Manifesto came out. So what we have there is a general term, revolutionary men. God is punishing us with revolutionary men. So if you let that sink in, people that I've been talking to and that have been praying these prayers for years now, they have a great confidence in what's going on in the world because they see that this is a punishment from God. And when you do that, you start to have wisdom. This devotion helps people get really rooted in the interior life. And I'm writing another book about total consecration to the holy face and how God draws the soul through the purgative, illuminative, and unitive ways. So Sister Mary St. Peter received these revelations, and revolutionary men are being the punishment to us today. And that should give us strength of mind because God's the one punishing, but he's our good dad, he's our Abba, he's our father. He's taking care of us. In his providence, his ways are very deep. This is the quickest, surest way for our human family to get spanked because we're being bad and to get things right. So I come from a state. The motto of Kansas is ad astra per aspera, to the stars, through adversity. So if you can Christianize that, it'd be to heaven through adversity. Through adversity, through adversity. It's great to be living in these times and to have this devotion and to have the Holy Rosary, Our Lady of Fatima. It's great to be a Catholic. And that's the neat thing, being a director or a promoter of this, is people send me emails, they talk to me personally, and they say, Father, this devotion is helping me have so much peace. So sister was receiving these revelations and 
One of them is about St. Dismas, the good thief. So Veronica is an example that she's given. And St. Dismas, because St. Dismas had greater faith than the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because those patriarchs saw the glory of God and had faith. But St. Dismas saw our Lord Jesus Christ suffering on a cross. And he made an act of faith. Lord, if you would, please allow me to come into your barred, into your kingdom. And what did our Lord say? You will be with me in paradise today. He made reparation for his sins by having contrition on the cross. So the male version of this devotion is St. Dismas. And St. Veronica, you all know, broke through the mob to console the face of Christ. So when the world revolution is trying to take away our church and our mass, we have to break through that mob and console the face of Christ as long as we still have it especially the Latin Mass, as long as we have it. So when I give a mission, my first talk is always about how to live as a Catholic once they take away, if and once they take away our priests. So one thing that's very important is, you, is to make spiritual communions. That means you're not able to receive communion corporally, but you make an act, like St. Alphonse Gori says, Oh, Lord, I'm not able to receive you corporately, become, but please come to me spiritually. And then send your guardian angels to, to adore our Lord in all the tabernacles of the world for an hour, since you don't have time to do that. They do. All right, I'll finish. We'll not finish. We'll continue this on the other side. On January 31st, 2019, Carolina Catholic Media signed on Charlotte's first Catholic radio station, AM 1270 WCGC. By the grace of God, we celebrate the past four years and look forward to continuing our apostolic vision and mission to serve the Carolina Catholic community. We are evangelistic partners with our clergy, active parishioners, the fallen away, and the homebound. We are accessible to all Christians, agnostics, and atheists. With distribution of a wide array of content across seven media platforms, there truly is something for everyone. During these past four years, Carolina Catholic has expanded to seven media platforms that include radio, internet stream, mobile app, website, YouTube, social media, and e-newsletter. Nearly all local programs are available by podcast and video on demand. In the year ahead, we're committed to promote more local parish, school, and ministry events, more live broadcasts, and more valuable content that showcases our dynamic local Carolina Catholic community. Of all the Catholic radio stations in the U.S., Carolina Catholic is arguably a leader in locally produced programs. To continue our work, Carolina Catholic Media needs $15,000 in monthly funding to continue operations across our seven media platforms. We are 100% dependent on your generosity. If you love what we're doing, please join us with a monthly tithe or annual gift. We have partnership plans available for parishes, schools, and ministries. If you own a business, you can be a program sponsor on one or all of our platforms. You can do a live broadcast of a special event with promotion before and rebroadcast after. On behalf of everyone at Carolina Catholic Media, we thank you for your past support and look forward to you joining us with the resources the apostolate needs to continue to evangelize the truth of Jesus Christ and our Catholic faith across the Carolinas. May God bless you and your family abundantly. Faith and charity are key elements of life, but are they at the center of your retirement planning and life insurance decisions? Knights of Columbus, a trusted organization with a proud history of more than 140 years of helping its members, can help Catholic families with insurance and retirement planning solutions. Most importantly, we do this in a way that is compatible with Catholic teaching and the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Investment Guidelines. Today, we have expanded our offerings to include retirement annuities, long-term care insurance, and disability income insurance. Beyond the benefits of financial protection, members may take satisfaction in knowing that Knights of Columbus contributes to causes that align with Catholic moral teaching. Let your faith inspire your financial decisions. Terms and conditions apply. Learn more by calling field agent Bob Gordon 
at 516-551-7838. Welcome back to the Sons of Fidelity. I'm your host, Steve Cunningham. Let's get right back to the issue of the day, the Holy Face uh, lecture that Father Carney gave uh, this week, uh, last week. Engage them. The angels are very powerful. So another character is Venerable Leo de Pont. Venerable Leo de Pont grew up in Martinique, which is part of the Caribbeans. Now, again, look at, look at the signs. Martinique, Martin. Okay, so he went to Paris. He was the son of a sugar plantation farmer, very wealthy. And so he was sent to be a lawyer to learn law in Paris. And he was very well to do. He had a very nice hotel. He even had a, someone as his driver. But he started to see the priests in Paris, how they would take care of these boys that were pretty much orphans. And they were chimney sweeps. That's how they would earn any money to eat. And they would sleep in the streets. But these priests would have a little weekly meetings for these boys to teach them the faith. And Venerable Leto Pont started going there, and he started to really draw, get closer to God. Then he moved back to Martinique, married his high school sweetheart. He was a lawyer for the city, and she was very ill. And on her deathbed, she was only in her 20s, they had one daughter, and she said, Leo, my one wish is that you have our daughter taught by the Ursulines like I was. And guess where the Ursulines taught her? Tours France. So St. Martin's at work here again. So we have Sister Mary St. Pierre who left the world on November the 11th, the Feast of St. Martin. Then we have Venerable Leo de Pont who comes from Martinique. Two tours. And He does business as a lawyer there, and then his daughter dies at a young age, like she was a teenager. And so he was devastated, but he saw the providence in God. He saw that this allowed him to be ready for something that was totally supernatural. And he would be a great donator to all the religious communities, especially the Carmelites. And the Mother Superior began to rely on him because the Carmelites, you know, they, they, they live a life that's very secluded from the world, and they have an extern who talks to the people, but they usually need somebody that's even more out in the world. So Mother went to Venerable Leo Pont and said, I would like you to help us with business affairs. And then Sister Mary St. Peter arrives on the scene, and she starts to have these locutions, and she tells Mother Superior about them, Now, Sister Mary St. Pierre, when she first joined the Carmel in tour, she said that she felt like she was at home. That's a beautiful feeling. So she began to receive these revelations, and then Mother introduced Venerable Little Pont to Sister Mary St. Pierre, and they began to talk, and Sister told all of these revelations that are so beautiful. And then Venerable Leo de Pont was a very holy man. They called him the holy man of tours because he used to walk around tours to make spiritual communions of the churches that were in crumbles after the French Revolution. And then the Archbasilica of St. Martin of Tours was destroyed by the French Revolution, and the relics of St. Martin were thought to have been looted and taken by the revolutionists. But he had a thing on his heart that told him, no, his relics are still here somewhere. So he met this lady who sold onions and carrots, and he went up to her and said, do you sell flowers to make fun? You know, he would joke around. And she said, no, I don't sell those. I sell carrots and onions and peppers. And he said, well, if I give you a quarter, will you tell me where the church stood before the French Revolution destroyed it, because she was very old. And this was the 1850s or so. 
And she said, you see that road over there, sir? The engineers thought that they would put the road over the tomb of St. Martin, but they missed by a few degrees. So the relics are over there and pointing to these three residential houses. And so St. Martin, or excuse me, Venerable Leo de Pont, he secretly bought these houses and talked to the archbishop. And he went to the place where St. Martin died and where he lived, two miles outside the city, because St. Martin was a bishop who lived like a monk. He was surrounded by monks. And he would come into the city once in a while, but he was a bishop that basically prayed, and that's how things happened. He had great faith in prayer. And so there was a cell of St. Martin, and that's where Venerable Leo de Pont, he slept down there a couple times. And he was with some men that had the nocturnal adoration where they would go and pray in the home at night to make reparation. And after the retreat, they told Venerable Leo de Pont, St. Martin de Tours resuscitated a dead man to life. You're being called by him to resuscitate his relics. So they began to dig, and the first day or two when they were digging, they heard this angelic music. And you know, St. Francis, when he heard angelic music, he was in ecstasy for three days. It's so beautiful. But they knew when they heard this that they were on to their goal to find his relics. So they kept digging, and they found his relics, and now we have his relics again. And it's a beautiful little story. So that's ba basically the history, because I only have 40 minutes. And I want to talk to you about the various objects of the holy face of Jesus. So the object of this devotion is the Vell of Veronica. And the Vell of Veronica deals with the Passion. Then we have the Shroud of Turin, which many of you know about that. That deals with the death. And then there's a Vell called the Vell of Monopello, which is in Italy, in Monopello, and that deals with the resurrection. So we have the Vell of Veronica, Passion, Shroud of Turin, Death, Vell of Monopello, Resurrection. This devotion deals with the veil of Veronica, so this devotion is about reparation and about the passion. So when Veronica received that image, she, re she retreated from our Lord with her friend, and this is from Baronius history. He was a protege of uh, St. Philip Neri, and she took the veil and put it on her table, didn't even know that the image was there. And she went into the corner and started weeping and saying, how is it that my Lord would allow me to wash his face? And then her friend saw the veil, turned it over and saw his face on it and said, come here. She began to cry more. How is it that my Lord left his image with me? And so she guarded that for her life. And Augustus Tiberius Augustus, the emperor of Rome, he had um, dropsy. So he had leprosy. And he heard that Jesus was curing people, raising people from the dead. So he sent an envoy because he wanted to get healed from his leprosy. And when his envoy went down there, they went to Pilate, and Pilate said, we've already killed him. And then his envoy went to the Jews and they asked, we were looking for this man who performed miracles. And they said, oh, that's just fables. The Christians, they're just crazy people. So the envoy, they're good Romans. They were not, they were determined to find an answer. So they found Veronica. And Veronica showed them the image and they knew immediately that was a miracle because there was no possibility of them to paint back in those days what they saw in that image. She said if she heard the story of the emperor and she said, if I go there and he sees it, he'll be healed instantly. So they invited her to come and she moved to Rome and she opened the veil to him and he was healed at the instant. And Augustus 
to bear as Augustus wanted to make a statue of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Loarium, which is a place in Rome where they had a bunch of statues of gods and goddesses. But typical politics wouldn't allow it because the Senate was furious that Tiberius Augustus was speaking directly with Pilate because the protocol was that Pilate should have been talking to the Senate before any information went to the emperor. So they vetoed the emperor's wish. So it was providence that our Lord's statue was not placed next to demons because in Psalms, all the other gods are demons. It's just the truth. Father Ripker once said that, and it's like, oh yeah, that's right, I've seen that in the Psalms all the time. So then, Veronica keeps that veil for her life, and then she passes away, but she wills it over to the popes. And the third successor of St. Peter, the fourth pope, uh, Celestis, receives that, and the popes have had it ever since, the veil of Veronica. Then this is a neat connection because Our Lady of Fatima appeared to the children on May the 13th. And one of the popes took the uh, Pantheon Church, which was a, a church for the gods and goddesses. And what all good Christians do when they destroy paganism is they erect Christian symbols like how, like uh, Christmas, they make that a, a holy day of obligation instead of a dark night of winter solstice around that time. That's what they do. So this pope, he consecrated this church. It was called St. Mary the Martyrs, and he had about 16 wagons of relics taken from the catacombs and placed in his church. So that's why it's Our Lady of the Martyrs. And they did this on May the 13th. We'll finish, uh, well, we won't finish. We'll continue this on the other side of this break. On January 31st, 2019, Carolina Catholic Media signed on Charlotte's first Catholic radio station, AM 1270 WCGC. By the grace of God, we celebrate the past four years and look forward to continuing our apostolic vision and mission to serve the Carolina Catholic community. We are evangelistic partners with our clergy, active parishioners, the fallen away, and the homebound. We are accessible to all Christians, agnostics, and atheists. With distribution of a wide array of content across seven media platforms, there truly is something for everyone. During these past four years, Carolina Catholic has expanded to seven media platforms that include radio, internet stream, mobile app, website, YouTube, social media, and e-newsletter. Nearly all local programs are available by podcast and video on demand. In the year ahead, we're committed to promote more local parish, school, and ministry events, more live broadcasts, and more valuable content that showcases our dynamic local Carolina Catholic community. Of all the Catholic radio stations in the U.S., Carolina Catholic is arguably a leader in locally produced programs. To continue our work, Carolina Catholic Media needs $15,000 in monthly funding to continue operations across our seven media platforms. We are 100% dependent on your generosity. If you love what we're doing, please join us with a monthly tithe or annual gift. We have partnership plans available for parishes, schools, and ministries. If you own a business, you can be a program sponsor on one or all of our platforms. You can do a live broadcast of a special event with promotion before and rebroadcast after. On behalf of everyone at Carolina Catholic Media, we thank you for your past support and look forward to you joining us with the resources the apostolate needs to continue to evangelize the truth of Jesus Christ and our Catholic faith across the Carolinas. May God bless you and your family abundantly. Faith and charity are key elements of life, but are they at the center of your retirement planning and life insurance decisions? Knights of Columbus, a trusted organization with a proud history of more than 140 years of helping its members, can help Catholic families with insurance and retirement planning solutions. Most importantly, we do this in a way that is compatible with Catholic teaching and the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Investment Guidelines. Today, we have expanded our offerings to include retirement annuities, long-term care insurance, and disability income insurance. 
Beyond the benefits of financial protection, members may take satisfaction in knowing that Knights of Columbus contributes to causes that align with Catholic moral teaching. Let your faith inspire your financial decisions. Terms and conditions apply. Learn more by calling field agent Bob Gordon at 516-551-7838. Welcome everybody back to Steve Cunningham with Sense of Fidel- the Census Fidelium Hour. And let's get back to our, well, not our guest, but a recording video from a couple of weeks ago or last week with Father Cardi on the Holy Face. And then every year to celebrate the consecration of that church, they would take out the veil of Veronica for about a century and go in procession. And then whenever there was a calamity or a war, they would take out this veil of Veronica to fight the enemy. And I've even heard, I don't know if it's true or if it's just legend, but they would even take the veil of Veronica when the Holy Roman Emperor would fight against the Turks, the Moors, or whoever the enemy was of Christendom, but it would not be allowed to be taken out unless the Holy Roman Emperor was fighting the battle. And they were very victorious with the Veil of Veronica because it's a relic of Jesus Christ. So my question is, why did Our Lady pick May the 13th? And then the consecutive months for six months, except for one, August, because the children were in prison, the 13th. Well, my thought is, there's probably a lot of reasons why she did that. Hopefully, we'll all get to heaven to find out. But maybe she wants to stress the importance in our times of the Veil of Veronica. Because in time of war, the Veil of Veronica was a weapon, a spiritual weapon. It's sort of like France has their spiritual weapon. Uh, Joan of Arc would take out the banner that St. Dennis had, and they would be victorious when they would have these relics. So this devotion, in my opinion, is for us to have the relic. We're giving out pictures. Um, Some people get linens with the holy face, and they put them in their rooms. And you know what? If you want, you ought to think about building a beautiful Christian uh, Catholic corner in your house or even a little chapel and have the Vela Veronica there and have a candle burning or an oil lamp burning day and night if you can, just in case the church is shut down again or for uh, a long time, you'll have a place where you can make your spiritual communions if the church gets shut down. Another thing that's important is to know how to do um, lay baptism in case anyone's dying, in case the priests are gone or we're all martyred. All you do is you take water and say, I baptize thee. You don't even have to say their name. I baptize thee in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Ghost. And that's a baptism. And even non-Catholics can do that. So tell your Protestant friends. I know this is North Carolina. There's a lot of Protestants here, I'm sure. So you can tell your friends that. That lay baptism. So there's some miracles that happen in Rome. This devotion just is so deep, and I'm not even able to scratch the tip of the iceberg in my own devotion of this. It just, it just keeps coming. So in 1848 or 1849, the Freemasons attacked the Pope, and they killed the Secretary of the State in cold blood. And the Pope's life was in great jeopardy, so he exiled himself to a city called Gaeta, And he commanded that all the churches of Rome make reparation because the revolutionary men that were sent by God were step by step taking away the power of the church. So they wanted to take the papal states because if you own land as a sovereign, you have some power there. So the church had power with land because... The coat of arms of the Pope has two swords, one's gold, one's silver. And even one Pope once marched in procession with two swords, one to show his spiritual authority, one to show his temporal authority. So the devil who uses these Freemasons, communists, and the revolutionary men, he knows how to destroy the church, and God's letting him do that. So the Pope, though, 
he, made, he fought back. And the canons of St. Peter's decided to put out the veil of Veronica for three days. And on the third day, a miracle happened. But let me explain. The veil was put out. And the veil, Cardinal Burke told me this. I haven't seen it yet. I, I've been too sick to go to Rome. I need to see it someday. But it's in, I'll tell you where, it has, where it's at later. But you can't see his face. You can't see the outlines of his face. It's, it's very dark. So they put a very thin piece of silk on front of this. It was on an easel or on an altar. And for three hours, the miracle that happened was this. The, the features of his face began to become bold on that white linen, and then there was a, there was a light that shone from behind the veil, well, from the veil onto this white, thin piece of silk. And it was a death like hue, like a death, like a, a light of someone that's dying. And the canons, you know, they're really, you know, they're Italians, but they're very logical men. They were moving, kneeling down in different places because they thought they were seeing a mirage. But everywhere they, they went, they saw this happening. And so they called the actuary, no, not the actuary, the notary of the Vatican, and he came and certified it. And it's in the Vatican Day book to this day. It's, it's a miracle. So when that miracle was happening, all these Italians came, they rang the bells, and these artists began to draw what they saw. And there's different renditions of the Vela Veronica copies. And so these were put onto silk and linens and touched to the Vela Veronica, to the spear of Longitudinus, and to a big part of of the Holy Cross, and they were sent abroad. Okay, I'll pause there for a minute, but I want to tell you where the veil is. It's, it's in the, there's four pillars that hold up the cupola of St. Peter's, and it's on the papal, it's on the uh, epistle side of the papal altar. It's on a second level where there's a big bas relief of Veronica, and she's got the veil. And so they, ex they expose the veil of Veronica on Passion Sunday once a year. So three of these copies were sent by benefactors to the Carmel in Tours. And the Mother Superior gave two to Venerable Leo de Pont, and he gave one to his men that do the nocturnal prayer, and he put one in his drawing room. And what happened is people would start coming to him and ask for healing because he was such a holy man. And the first miracle was a lady whose eyes were very, in very great pain. And so he had confidence, kneel down, let's pray. And he took the oil and gave it to her and she rubbed him on her eyes and the pain went away. And then there was a high school boy who was in a wheelchair. His limbs weren't working very well came in and had the confidence to pray and Venerable Little Pont had him anointed, prayed the formula. He started running around the backyard. And then this was the first two of over 6,000 certified miracles. So 6,000 certified miracles? What is a certified miracle? That means a physician signed under oath that this cure was not a cause, physical explanation or scientific explanation. That's a wonder worker. And Blessed Pius IX heard about this and he said he is one of the greatest wonder workers of all times. Now, let me put that into context. If that doesn't mean anything to you, St. Vincent Ferrer is one of my favorite saints. He's in the order of St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, St. Dominic, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas Church, here we are. He performed probably 10,000 plus miracles. When he performed Miracles, they would ring a bell. And one time, I don't know if this is legend or story or truth. I think it's true. Father Roach taught me, might as well err on the side of being pious. There was a man, well, he did not have permission to perform miracles. His superior said, you need to stop. And I don't remember the reason. But there was a man falling from a rafter. He was in midair, and Saint 
Vince Barrera came by and said, wait a minute, I got to go ask permission before I can make a miracle here. So he was suspended in midair and he went to superiors and asked for permission. There's a guy that's falling. Can I, can I perform a miracle? And they, they gave permission and then he came back and blessed him and he landed safely. So that guy, St. Vincent Ferrer, had just a few more miracles of Venerable Leo de Pont. Venerable Leo de Pont's a layman. He has not been canonized. He's not even blessed. All you men, he's a great example. So read The Holy Man of Tours. Unfortunately, Tan's publishers lost the rights to it, so it's Jerome Press. They publish it now, The Holy Man of Tours. So those miracles in Rome, the, the miracles that happened with Venerable Leo de Pont, that tells us that this devotion, that tells me this devotion has an exponential potential to do something in the world. Because I was meant to research this, to find it, and to become an apostle of it. November 11 being my birthday. Before I became a seminarian, I was in investments. I was an investment analyst. I was helping manage $400 million. And my job was to find little companies to find good balance sheets and profits and, you know, ratios and say to our investment council, these guys are the winners, let's get rid of these guys and we'll make a lot of money. Well, my dad said, are you going to make wealthy people more wealthier for the rest of your life? I said, oh, I think God wants me to be a priest. So I became a priest. And I've, I see what this devotion, what it has started to be and what it can be. It can be really big. <clears throat> now we'll finish it. Since I keep saying we'll finish it, and we'll finish this on the other side of this break. On January 31st, 2019, Carolina Catholic Media signed on Charlotte's first Catholic radio station, AM 1270 WCGC. By the grace of God, we celebrate the past four years and look forward to continuing our apostolic vision and mission to serve the Carolina Catholic community. We are evangelistic partners with our clergy, active parishioners, the fallen away, and the homebound. We are accessible to all Christians, agnostics, and atheists. With distribution of a wide array of content across seven media platforms, there truly is something for everyone. During these past four years, Carolina Catholic has expanded to seven media platforms that include radio, internet stream, mobile app, website, YouTube, social media, and e-newsletter. Nearly all local programs are available by podcast and video on demand. In the year ahead, we're committed to promote more local parish, school, and ministry events, more live broadcasts, and more valuable content that showcases our dynamic local Carolina Catholic community. Of all the Catholic radio stations in the U.S., Carolina Catholic is arguably a leader in locally produced programs. To continue our work, Carolina Catholic Media needs $15,000 in monthly funding to continue operations across our seven media platforms. We are 100% dependent on your generosity. If you love what we're doing, please join us with a monthly tithe or annual gift. We have partnership plans available for parishes, schools, and ministries. If you own a business, you can be a program sponsor on one or all of our platforms. You can do a live broadcast of a special event with promotion before and rebroadcast after. On behalf of everyone at Carolina Catholic Media, we thank you for your past support and look forward to you joining us with the resources the apostolate needs to continue to evangelize the truth of Jesus Christ and our Catholic faith across the Carolinas. May God bless you and your family abundantly. Faith and charity are key elements of life, but are they at the center of your retirement planning and life insurance decisions? Knights of Columbus, a trusted organization with a proud history of more than 140 years of helping its members, can help Catholic families with insurance and retirement planning solutions. Most importantly, we do this in a way that is compatible with Catholic teaching and the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Investment Guidelines. Today, we have expanded our offerings to include retirement annuities, long-term care insurance, and disability income insurance. Beyond the benefits of financial protection, members may take satisfaction in knowing that Knights of Columbus contributes to causes that align with Catholic moral teaching. 
Let your faith inspire your financial decisions. Terms and conditions apply. Learn more by calling field agent Bob Gordon at 516-551-7838. Welcome everybody back. It's Steve Cunning with the Sense of Fidelium Hour. Just coming at you with the last segment of the Father uh, Carney uh, lecture he gave last week or the week before in Charlotte. So without further ado, the last segment. And it needs to be really big. It's a beautiful devotion. 6,000 miracles. I forgot what I was going to say, but it finally came back. Sometimes I'm slow about the Holy Spirit. So Jesus Christ told Sister Mary St. Peter, I'm paraphrasing, this devotion needs to be canonically established. Sister Mary St. Peter, that's your job. And so it was established by Pope Leo XIII as an arch confraternity, so it's canonically to the hilt. It's perfect. And then he also told her, this devotion is going to be spread, but then it will almost go into remission. And there will be a second wave of apostles in, in later times that will promote it. That's where we're at, folks. God has given me the opportunity to be a chaplain of nuns, and my bishop has let me be free to spend lots of time on this. I'm the only priest that gets to do this almost full time, and I love it. And my hope is that there will be a million people who will sign up to the Arch Confraternity of the Holy Face or any Confraternity of the Holy Face before I pass away. Because if you look in the secret of the Holy Fa or the secret of the Rosary, that great book written by that great saint, Saint Louis de Montfort of the French school, he's, he has a chapter in there about Blessed Alan de la Rocha, who passed away in the Order of Sanctity in 1475. And Our Lady appeared to him and said, you have not been faithful to me, but I have been faithful to you. He was a Dominican but he was living a life, not of ill repute, but it wasn't holy. But she gave mercy to him and had a lock of her hair made into a necklace and put it around his neck and put a, a ring on his finger and told him, preach the rosary, preach the angelic psalter. And so he did for the rest of his life, doing what I'm doing like with this devotion, but with him with the rosary, he had 100,000 people enroll in the confraternity of the Holy Rosary, and he has BL in front of his name. BL period, blessed. I want to become a saint. So I want a million people. We have the technology. People like Steve Cunningham, he's a big devotee to the Holy Face. Priests, let me come here like Father. You. And once people get on fire with this, then they'll tell their friends. And it's, it's not a nasty pyramid. It's a pyramid. It's, 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 a, it's a holy pyramid to get people to be able to do something. So at the end of the day, what's the last thing I'm going to say? It's this, some practical things to really encourage you. In 2019, people came to me and said, Father, the world's on fire. What can we do? I didn't know what to do. So I went and prayed in front of my holy face. And our Lord put on my heart. This is normal. People get this all the time. I'm not a mystic. But he put on my heart, go tell her to start devotion to the holy face in North Dakota, where she lives. She was at the Abbey in Gower, Missouri. And that's what I've been doing ever since 2019. And now there's 35 prayer groups that I've helped start. They start in parishes or they start at homes. And I said, just start praying the prayers. You don't even have to recruit people. Just pray and God will send you the right people. You know, it's against this false, this uh, phantom heresy called Americanism where the spiritual life or religion is about doing things, but no, it's about being a deep person in prayer. And so these people 
there's about two or 300 of them that are really close to me that I've been promoting. They are so confident and happy with this devotion because it's an answer to the world going on fire. They have something they can do as Catholics, and it's not doing activity whatsoever. St. Thomas Aquinas talks about the greatest life is the apostolic life, and that's not doing any activity whatsoever, but it's having contemplation first. Then when you get interrupted, to share that contemplation with others. Well, that's what this devotion does. It's having contemplation with the face of God. It's preparing us for the beatific vision. This devotion, I think, will help you to penetrate mysteries that you've never been able to penetrate before. This devotion has nine secrets. I don't have time to get into them. One of them is so beautiful that whoever is, promotes the holy face of our Lord, their, sh their faces will shine brighter in heaven than any other faces. Much can be told, much can be revealed about a person's face. If you go to the high security prison, prison in your state and look at the, the faces of those men versus the convent of nuns I take care of, you're gonna see a difference. You're gonna see a difference in the people. So this devotion, I think, will help you all get rooted in the interior life, because that's why you were born, is to be in union with God. So if the world goes up in flames, you have Jesus in your heart. And that's what um, Father Reginald Garrigou Lagrange, he talks about the transforming union, which is the highest state of union. St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Therese of Lisieux, they talk about what it is, is basically the God that's dwelling within you, if you're in the state of grace, is you get so connected to that, to God who's in you, that you just become transformed and in union with him. And it's past certain stages of ecstasy that go along, because ecstasy means you kind of just go stiff for a while, because it's so overwhelming when God is is uniting himself to you, but that shows that you're weak. But once you go past those stages, you become more normal again. You don't go in XT. I haven't gone to those three stages. I've read about it, and I want to go through it, but this devotion, I think, will help us in our, in our interior life greatly. And even though the sky may be falling, you'll have our Lord. So I'm just out of time, and I just really want to thank you if you want to to buy my book. I have it here and I'll sign it and I'll be back there to answer questions. I, the parish has printed out enrollment forms. Um, if you want to sign up, it's a commitment. Um, six things that are required. You enroll, you receive the enrollment, then you wear an effigy. So they will send you a, a scapular of the holy face or, and or a cross with the holy face, so you need to wear, I wear mine underneath because I'm not allowed to wear it outside because I would look like a bishop. And to say, O Lord, show us thy face and we shall be saved. A pater and Ave Maria and a glory be. Once a day. So that's one hour or one minute a day for the rest of your life. Then you got to promote it. Like I'm preaching, like fathers let me be here, like anybody else that talks about it to other people in writing. And then lastly, go to the monthly meetings. That's the hard, that's the big guy, to go to the monthly meetings. Because what does the revolution want to do? They want to divide, conquer us, isolate us. But this devotion wants us to get together to see each other face to face. So that's what is required of it. And if you can't buy the book, of course, I have a website called the League of St. Martin. You just search that and you'll find it. And we have some just some little things in there, some bullet points that you can learn more about this. And if you have questions, um, we have an email there too. So please, Neil, and I'll give you all a blessing. Benedictio de omnipotentis patris et filii spiritus unshindet super vos et maniat semper. Amen. And here are some of the promises. Since Father was not able to get into it, I have the little booklet that he sells on their website. It's the 
manual of the Arch Confraternity of the Holy Face booklet. So they sold out the first time we promoted it a couple years ago, but here it is. Anyway, the promise is nine of them. They shall receive in themselves by the impression of my humanity a bright iridation of my divinity and shall be so illuminated by it in their most in their inmost souls that by their likeness to my face they shall shine with a brightness surpassing that of many others in eternal life uh, number two saint mactilde having asked our lord that those who celebrate the memory of his sweet face should never be deprived of his amiable co company he replied not one of them shall be separated from me number three our lord said saint uh, said sister maria saint pierre has promised me that he will imprint his divine likeness on the souls of those who honor his most holy countenance uh, number four by my holy face you shall work miracles five by my holy face you shall obtain the conversion of many sinners nothing that you shall ask and make in this offering will be refused to you if you knew how pleasing the sight of my face is to my father number six as in a king as in a kingdom you can procure all you wish for with a coin marked with the prince's effigy so in the kingdom of heaven you will obtain all you desire with the precious coin of my holy humanity which is my adorable countenance number seven all those who honor my holy face in a spirit of reparation will be doing will so will will by so doing perform the office of the pious veronica Number eight, according to the care you take in making reparation to my face disfigured by blasphemies, so will I take care of yours, which has been disfigured by sin. I will reprint therein my image and render it as beautiful as it was on leaving the baptismal font. And finally, our Lord has promised me, said again, Sister St. Pierre, for all those who defend this cause, his cause, for all those who defend his cause in the work of reparation by words, by prayers, or in writings, that he will defend them before his father at their death. He will purify their souls by eff 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 effacing all the blots of sin and will restore to them their primitive beauty. Anyways, God love you. Have a great rest of the week.